Hi, I'm Craig Smith, and this is Eye on AI. One of the few good things about the ongoing pandemic is that it has slowed life down and allowed many of us to look around, watch the birds, and wonder about the trees. This week's guest, Pietro Perona, a professor at the California Institute of Technology, is one of the brains behind a pair of smartphone apps that help you do just that, eBird and iNaturalist. But simple as the apps are to use in identifying tens of thousands of species, the science behind them is complex. Gathering enough examples for each species to train a neural network is difficult, if not impossible. Much of Professor Perona's work, then, has been focused on making machines more efficient learners, requiring less training data. He talked about the challenges of building computer vision models that can handle long-tailed distributions. I hope you find the conversation as fascinating as I did. If you could start just sort of introducing yourself and how you developed intellectually. Sure. I graduated in electrical engineering at the University of Padua in Italy in 85, which is a long time ago. And then I thought it would be fun to go for a PhD in Berkeley. So I applied to Berkeley and I thought I would do a PhD in control theory. And so when I got there, control theory, which is the discipline that lets you build, say, autopilots or controls for chemical plants, I got to read a paper by chance, a paper that talked about how you could use stochastic models for understanding images. It was using something similar to what people were using in control theory, but in order to do image analysis of sorts. And I got hooked on the question of how to understand images. It seemed to be very interesting and nobody knew exactly how to do it. And I'm somewhat attracted by by problems that are open problems, difficult, not even well formalized. And also I'm very attracted by images in general. I studied art history in high school, so I love art. Anyway, I'm a visual person, and so it felt exciting and interesting. And at the time, the first computer vision professor had joined Berkeley. That was Jitendra Malik, who had just gotten his PhD from Stanford, and he was looking for students. And so I started working with him. And that's how I got interested in vision. So just to maybe trace a little bit my trajectory over time, back then in the 80s, the problem that people worked on in vision was segmentation, which is how do you divide up the image into meaningful components, which could correspond to parts of objects like your head and your sweater and your hands. And so could you do that purely starting from image properties like the color or stereoscopic disparity? And we didn't yet know how even to think about the problem of visual recognition, which is what most people are interested in today. I was one of the very few people in the 90s to become interested in visual categorization, which is the question of how would you build a system that is able to recognize frogs or automobiles or trees. And at the time, people working on visual categorization were focusing on two categories. They were focusing mostly on faces, human faces, and vehicles, automobiles. But the idea at the time was that you would handcraft models that were specific to faces or automobiles. And so once you had solved faces and automobiles, you would have to start again from scratch if you wanted to do frogs or mushrooms. And at the time, I thought it wouldn't scale. And we knew that we wanted to recognize tens of thousands of objects, maybe hundreds of thousands. So if you think of how many animals are there. Right now, for iNaturalist, we aim for half a million animals. And then you can think of all the monuments that you know about and all the books you know about and so on. And so you get very quickly to many millions of different things that you want to recognize. And so if you think of categories, it could be a million categories you want to recognize. Handcrafting models doesn't seem to be the right way to go. And so I collected a data set called Caltech 101 which embodied the problem of broad categorization. And so the challenge I threw to the rest of my colleagues was, well, can you build a piece of software 
that can be trained to recognize any one of these 101 categories without changing of line of code. And so in some ways, that's the point where I saw that at least a piece of computer vision was going from geometry and physics to learning. So it became very clear to me that learning was the way to go for computer vision. And deep networks had been around for a while, but somehow we didn't have computers that were fast enough for training deep networks. So we're not using deep networks at the time. We're using simpler mechanisms. So what happens then is that the students with whom I had collected Caltech 101, and that's Fei Fei Li, who is a professor at Stanford now, after she left my group, she remained interested in this question and she thought, okay, what's the next logical step? And so Caltech 101 was 100 images per categories. And she thought, okay, let's go to a thousand categories, a thousand images per category to do something really useful for the field. And in fact, that was ImageNet eventually. And it was a beautiful piece of work that people initially did not understand. So people couldn't tell what Fei Fei was doing until Jeff Hinton used ImageNet to train a deep network, basically a version of Yang LeCun's Lenet that Yang LeCun had used very well on handwritten digits. And so finally, ImageNet provided enough images to train all the parameters that are there in a big deep network. And so we saw a huge improvement in error rates. And so error rates went overnight from 35% down to about 20% or 15%, so more or less half. And so that was the end of 2012. And that's when everyone realized, okay, so this is a, a practical way to go. Learning is the way to go for vision, but also for speech and many other aspects of AI. And now we're all working on that type of scenario, which is a very partial scenario. It will change in time. But at the moment, we are making a lot of progress using deep networks. So this is the long story. In my work, I've tried to help challenge the field with new questions. And so once we saw that Caltech 101 and ImageNet were approachable, I started thinking about what are the limits for learning. And there are two or three directions that I became interested in. One was how many categories can we recognize with a single network? The second one, which is more interesting, is can we achieve the same efficiency of learning as humans? And so here comes a very interesting observation, which is on the one side, deep networks as of 2017, give or take, that's my threshold year in my mind, deep networks have achieved the ability to outperform human experts at their game. And so there are papers about classifying skin lesions, there are papers from classifying birds and so on. And each one of these domains, you can claim with a straight face that the machine is doing better than a human. And there are some caveats, but it's very impressive what the machines can do. So you could say machines are better than human, and that's true in terms of overall accuracy. But that's when you have infinite training examples. Now, if the training examples are difficult to come by, humans are much more efficient learners, which means they can achieve high performance with far fewer training examples than the machine in many fields, not all of them, but in many fields. So if you ask a birder, how many photographs of a given new species do you need to see in order to learn to recognize that species? The birder will tell you, well, show me three, four, maybe 10, and then be able to do a good job. And a machine with 10 training examples doesn't do very well nowadays. It doesn't approach human ability. And so to approach human ability, you need a thousand training examples per species. And so that's where we still have trouble scaling, which is we don't have enough images for most categories. So as we went about building these data sets that people used for training their algorithms, like Caltech 101 and ImageNet, there is one called COCO that we collected. We worked very hard so that we would have roughly the same number of training images per category. So if we decided to have 100 categories, we wanted to have 100 training images per category in Caltech 101 or 10,000 training images per category in COCO. But that's not how the world is shaped. The world is shaped like a long tail distribution. Some things are really abundant and some things are rare. And you see that everywhere. So if you survey the species of the trees that line the streets of Los Angeles. You find two or three species like jacarandas and Mexican palms and so on are very frequent. And some species, many of them, have only 
one to 10 exemplars. Now, the same is if you talk to an eye doctor and you ask them, how many pathologies do you treat? And they say, oh, there are about 600 pathologies of the retina or whatever. And how many do you see on a given day? Oh, it's always the same one or two or three. And then top 10, we see them every month. And the top 100, we see them every year. And then the rest, we never see. You know, Maybe one of us will see them in one in their lifetime and so on. And same is with birds and animals and types of people. So think of nowadays people talk about training machines to transcribe what people say. And there is a question of how many languages can we bring online? Can we understand everybody's dialect? And the fact is that you find some languages like Chinese and Spanish that have an enormous number of speakers and then come from Italy where some dialects are just spoken in a tiny valley somewhere. And so if uh, a company wants to build a machine that transcribes that language, it will have to work really hard to get enough training examples and it will probably not be worth their while. So the world is a long tail distribution and it's easy to acquire and annotate a bit expensive, but you can do it. Samples for the most frequent things. But if you want really to go to get the infrequent ones, then machines have to become efficient learners. There is no way you can collect and annotate enough examples of some rare birds of Costa Rica. It depends a little bit on what your application is, of course. If you're transporting people on airplanes, all the seats are the same size. And I feel very uncomfortable in an airplane seat. And then maybe the lady sitting next to me has an enormous amount of space because she's small. So the airline industry works with one size fits all. And they figure out what's the average size of a human and they go with it. Now, the t-shirt industry works with five sizes, right? Now, if you are an oncologist or if you are a birder, maybe the most valuable things for you are making diagnosis of the things that you don't see frequently. And so you become a famous doctor because you're a great diagnostician and you're able to spot stuff that is rare and other doctors would miss. So the rare event is very valuable in some disciplines. And so in many cases, we want to train machines to be able to learn quickly rare events. And that's what we want to do. So the challenge now that many people have realized is not only train machines on a great number of categories, up to a million, for example, but also make them very efficient in learning. And so allow them to learn from very few training examples. I've spoken to Anne Ring about augmenting data sets, but I've also spoken to Jan Lacoon about self-supervised learning that doesn't depend on annotated data sets. So which direction are you pointing? Well, in my group, there are all of the above. We are looking at all of these different techniques. And there are many approaches that people are taking. None has had great success so far. So there are lots of scattered efforts with different ideas. So the first paper we wrote on what people call low-shot learning or one-shot learning dates back to pre-deep networks. It's 2003. And it was with Fei Fei and Rob Fergus, who is a colleague of Jan LeCun now at NYU. So here is the idea that we looked at there, and I think it's more or less the same idea that will win in the end. The matter is, how do you make it work? And the idea is this one. If I want to recognize a new type of bird, I still know that it's a bird, and so it has all the features of birds, like a beak and a head and an eye and feet and so on. And so ideally, I can have a hierarchical model of birds where there is a Ur model that has all the commonalities between birds, and then... As I come down the phylogenetic tree, I can specialize it down for different species. So it's well known that, for example, when you recognize people's faces, you are much better at recognizing people that belong to your own ethnic group rather than different ethnic groups. And it's not because your genes are different. It's just because of training. And so if you take, I'm going to say, a Chinese who has grown up in Italy, they will recognize much better Italian faces and Chinese faces, right? And so just how you get trained. So it's pretty clear that humans are very good at generalizing from things they know well already. And I don't know if you have children, but you see that in children around age three and four, that initially they overgeneralize. And so every four-legged animal becomes a cow or a cat or a dog, whatever was the first name that they gave to a four-legged animal. And then at some point, they are able to form distinctions and they become hyper 
discriminatory. I don't know exactly what the word would be, but hyper discriminatory. Around age six, they notice very fine details. And so I remember my children pointing out to me that Pasadena buses, there are two types that are absolutely very different. And what's the difference? Well, that some detail of the last wind of the bus, in some buses it was horizontal and in some buses it was slanted upwards. And to them it was huge. It was like cows and horses, two very different objects. So I saw that very well in my children. That You start off from not having the correct models in your brain for handling objects in the world and you overlamp things that don't belong together, you put them in the same model. And then at some point you form exquisitely different models and you go almost too far the other way around and you start discriminating well and making lots of categories. Many kids become fascinated with this. So the idea that Feifei, Rob and I had was to construct this using probability density functions and you need to be somewhat clever with how you write these probability density functions. They're not just average garden variety Gaussians. They are complicated models. So we had our own type, which was called the constellation model, and it was modeling separately the shape of object categories and the appearance of the different parts that constitute these object categories. And what we saw is that even if objects were not very similar, we could train a system to detect a car with just one car example if we had trained it first to detect faces, aircraft, and spotted cats, or some three or four different other categories. Because using these categories, we could build up this general model that then could be specialized to new categories. And so it's the same way if your face was the first one I ever saw and had never seen faces before. So you have a little mole near your left eye. I could think that that's a very distinctive face attribute and I could obsess about that. And I could obsess about the third hair of your left mustache and I wouldn't learn much that is useful. But if I've seen many faces before, I know that I can safely disregard those details. And instead, I can go for your eyeglasses are a pretty good thing and your style of beard and things like that. So if you are familiar with a general domain that could be birds or it could be mushrooms, then learning a new species becomes very easy. So how do we construct this broad category or mother of all categories first and then instantiate down different subcategories and so on. That's what everybody's trying to do at the moment. People are really working hard on that. And we will get there. We know by looking at humans, we know it's possible. Would that be done just as the visual cortex or as neural nets do through layers? The layers start out with very general features and then they become more refined as the impulses are passed through the layers? Well, if I knew it, I would be doing it. I don't know. Some tasks are very easy, like uh, recognizing handwritten digits is fairly easy. Using a deep network that has three layers, you get the maximum performance already. While some other tasks like fine distinctions between bird species require many more layers and much more training. So my sense is that it's going to be complicated. There are going to be details that matter a lot that we have to figure out. And so we could say it's like the brain because we know that the brain is an existence proof. Things are working in the brain. But what will the manifestation be in a machine? I don't know yet. We have a center at Caltech called Computation and Neural Systems, CNS, and it was founded in 1986, believe it or not. And so, in fact, Caltech and the CNS program at Caltech are the birthplace of neural networks. There was somebody called John Hopfield, for example, was an early pioneer. And it's also the birthplace of the NIPS conference, which today is called NeurIPS, which started off at Caltech. So many of us believe that it's very important to work simultaneously on physiology, perception, and computation, and exchange ideas. And of course, planes don't fly by flapping their wings like the birds, but there are many principles that are there, like the fact that you would have wings in the first place, and what's the profile of the wing, and all of that. By engaging students to work on computation, on perception, and on physiology, modeling the physiology and measuring the physiology of the brain, we can create a new generation of scientists who are able to make progress in areas or with ideas that wouldn't come about otherwise. But when you talk about working on this long tail with sparse data, you're focused on the computation, not on the manipulation of the data sets. As I said, you could just augment the data sets 
so that you have larger data sets created out of a few examples. That's right. Visipedia is a project I'm working on with Serge Belongi, who is a professor at Cornell Tech, and our students, and a number of other faculty who have joined our effort. So there we work with a community, which is the one of the birders, and another community, which is the one of the field naturalists. These are people who generate images in the process of pursuing their interest. And let's work on the images they generate rather than collecting them ourselves, and let's have them annotate them. So the data sets we acquire with the birders and with the naturalists have exactly that long-tailed characteristic that we were talking about before. And there is this huge stimulus of making do with few training images. And so now with iNaturalist, we graduate a species to become recognizable by the machine when we have about 30 training images, which does not guarantee the best performance. But if you have a good user interface for the person who is using the system and they can see the top 10 choices the machine is making, maybe they will find something useful there and it's better than nothing. That's a very productive way of thinking about the problem. So work with a community that is happy to give you the images and who can benefit from your work immediately. doesn't need to be perfect. Have you downloaded iNaturalist? Yes, both eBird and iNaturalist. I haven't used them yet, but I'm excited about it because I've downloaded all the various commercial apps none of which are great. So I'm eager to see how this works. Yeah, I hope that your listeners will download these apps too. And so there are hundreds of thousands of people who have downloaded them and use them every day. And I often find people who rave about those apps and they truly enjoy using them. And the app, does it have a feedback loop that improves the training? Yes, you could think of iNaturalist as maybe the first online learning machine where Every month or two, Scott Lowry, who is the chief of iNaturalist at the California Academy of Science, he can press a big red button, speaking metaphorically. He adds all of the new images that were classified to the training set, and the machine learns from its users to do a better job next time. But again, going back to this idea of augmenting data sets, I found that really compelling. Is that something that you guys work on? You take five images of a plant and then you just manipulate those images into a million? Yes. So there are a number of techniques for augmenting and some are absolutely prosaic and simple. So you can think that if you take a picture of a bird of a plant and you mirror image the picture, so you flip left, right, it's still a valid picture of the same plant. The species doesn't change. And then you make it a little bit smaller, a little bit bigger. It should still be the same plant. No problem. So that's called data augmentation. And of course, you would like the machine to be able not to need those silly manipulations and to figure it out by itself, a bit like our own visual system. It's interesting because invariances are somewhat built into our visual system. And when we learn how to read, sometimes we have to unlearn the invariances. And so you can think of the typical mistakes that little kids make of drawing a capital B with the bubbles on the left instead of the right, or the mistake B and D in lowercase. And that's because their visual system is invariant for mirror imaging. And they have to unlearn that for that specific thing, which is letters. But that data augmentation, what you're saying is you don't want to have to rely on that. You're looking for a solution that can work with the actual data available. Yes. So we have built a, and that was Jan LeCun's contribution, we've built the translation invariance into deep networks by making them convolutional. And there are other invariances that are clearly useful. And so one of them is left, right, mirror symmetry. Another one is scale. And another one is sort of invariance with respect to lighting conditions. And so ideally, those will be, again, built into the structure of the network, and the network will not have to learn those invariances from scratch. Or maybe the trading will happen, but it will happen with one type of object, but then it will be retained for all the other objects. So some of the people who work on self-supervision are hoping to use self-supervision tasks exactly to learn into the network useful strategies that then can be used by other modalities. On self-supervision in this context, for example, on the long tail of taxonomy, would you pre-train in a self-supervised manner so that a neural net could differentiate between kinds of objects and that would get you partway there and then it would need less 
annotated data to go the last mile. Right. So that has been successful in some domains, but not others. So it's not very general at the moment. For example, people who work on face recognition, they train the network to do a very simple task, which is compare two images and decide if it's the same person or a different person. Now, to do that trick on your face, you can train the network on my face and my wife's face and my friend's face, and then the network is ready to do same or different on new faces it has never seen before. So for faces, things generalize well, and you can learn same or different on a training set, and then it works well on new faces. For bird species, it's not quite that way. And probably it's because, first of all, we have more training examples, and then faces maybe are less variable than birds. Can you talk a little bit about your project in Pasadena with the trees? And I've seen some discussion of mapping all the trees in the world from satellite imagery. Could you do it at the species level if you had a system that was trained to that level that you could count how many of one species there are in all of the United States and identify their locations? Yes, in principle, not from satellite images. There is not enough detail, but from street level images. And so there are a number of companies that collect street level images, and some of them are crowdsourced and some of them are more commercial. The most famous example is Google Street View. So in those images, you see the trees very well, and you can therefore do a virtual tour of a city by going around following these images. And you can classify all the trees you see with very high accuracy. So as I was saying before, It's a long tail distribution, so it's entirely possible that in any given city there are a small number of trees, maybe 10-20% of the trees that belong to species that you've never seen before. And so, of course, the system would not be able to put a name on those trees. It would know that they are unknown. But at the level of 90% correct, 85-90% correct, yes, that's possible. And it's very useful for cities now because cities need to plan for climate change. And as you know, there are three species that work well with a certain level of humidity and temperature, but have trouble when the climate changes. And so cities need to plan. And most cities don't know what trees they have. And this is strange, but that's the way it is. So it would be great to be able to map all the cities of all the world and tell them what they have and where so that they could plan. And there is a second reason for that, which is often cities ask for federal funds, both here in Europe, they ask for government funds to replant trees. And what happens is they plant lots of trees, but then they don't maintain them. You need to water them for three or four years after you planted them. You need to look after them and prune them at the right time and so on. And so just monitoring the success of planting programs and funding cities that are more successful and so on would set into motion the right set of incentives so that we have better canopy over our trees. Now, I live in Pasadena, where there is a beautiful urban forest, but it's not true for all the cities around the world. What I was referring to on the satellite, Planet Labs takes relatively low-orbit images of the Earth. That's not high enough resolution for what you're talking about? Yeah, so it looks a little bit low resolution. And what I'm thinking about is, I wrote a story a few years ago about the changing of the autumnal colors, you know, the fall colors, and how it's growing later, and that the projections with climate change are that the maples, which are the most vibrant colors in the fall, are slowly going to move north as the atmosphere, the climate warms. But then they're going to reach a northern limit, and the band of maples will eventually narrow. And it would be interesting if you had this kind of technology to be able to map that over time, how the different species are changing. You're absolutely right. And another place where I'm quite interested, but again, I'm no botanist, so you know my interest doesn't count, but in any case, is in arid climates, which you see here in California, you see them in a certain belt between the Sahara and the forests of Africa. So in arid climates, you see typically isolated trees that can be very old. But if those trees die, it's unclear that a new tree can grow because the conditions have changed. 
And so those are areas where you can see individual trees. They're not in a forest. And counting those and quantifying this change seems to be very important to me. An iNaturalist, hopefully listeners will download it, but I haven't used it yet. I can go in my backyard and identify 70 to 80 percent of the trees in the woods of the backyard i'm in new england yes yes i haven't seen your backyards so i cannot uh, i cannot promise anything but here is what happens it can recognize about fifty thousand species of plants and animals right now now you say well fifty thousand compared to your goal of half a million is very little but again it's a long tail distribution and those are the fifty thousand that occur most often And so chances are that if you take an image of a moth or of a lizard or of a tree, it will be something that someone else has imaged before. And if the image is reasonably good quality, the system is going to be able to make suggestions that are successful most of the time in terms of the species. Now, iNaturalist has something really marvelous that was created by Scott Lowry at the California Academy of Science. And that is a community of naturalists that will come in and look at the images you upload and will verify that the species determinations you make are correct. So after a few days that you have uploaded an image, you want to create an account and you want to upload your image with a GPS location of where you are. And after a few days, you start seeing little call boxes popping up and that there are people who have commented on your identification and either have confirmed it or have expressed a different opinion. And so what we built into the system is a statistical analysis machinery that will consider both the opinions of different people and also their reputation or their ability to make good species determinations for different parts of the family tree of plants and animals. And so you might have people who have a really good ability to recognize butterflies, others do better on moths, others do better on lizards, and so on. And so by combining the opinion of many people, some of whom are experts and some are novices like you and I, the machine will come up with a level of confidence that the species was identified correctly. And so once the level of confidence reaches 95%, the magic number, then the photograph is deemed to be research quality and we use the label that the machine has come up with as the training example for the next generation of machines. So it's a whole community working together thanks to the machine. So what is Visipedia? And it's this idea that knowledge is not inside the machines to start with. The knowledge is with the people. And so there are three ingredients to make this cake. So there are machines that are very good when you train them. There are communities. And so the knowledge is not even with any member of the community. It's with the community itself. So nobody knows all the birds of the world, but the ensemble of all the birders will recognize all the birds. And then you have data, which are photographs in our case. And so how do you combine communities of experts, data, and computers in a way that in the end, there is a higher level of knowledge and capability than what you started with? And so that's the big challenge of Wikipedia. Wonderful. That's it for this week's podcast. I want to thank Pietro for his time. If you want to learn more about Pietro's work, you can find a transcript of this episode on our website, I on AI, that's E-Y-E hyphen O-N dot A-I. I encourage all of you to download eBird and iNaturalist, both to use and to train the algorithms going forward. We love to hear from listeners, so feel free to contact us with comments or suggestions. The singularity may not be near, but AI is about to change your world, so pay attention.